Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheldon, for those kind comments, for your friendship. Sheldon left off the part that also during me and my family's time here in Richmond, he was our family doc as well, which was uh, pretty good to have the head of VCU be your family doc down the street. Um, it is great to be back in Richmond. It's wonderful to see so many friends. I, I want to make some thanks, but there are a number of you who I've seen um, briefly as I was walking around there, also everybody saying, you know, Mark, how's it, how's it going? Uh, how's the transition so far? It is different going from being His Excellency the Governor of the Commonwealth <laughs> to the junior senator number 91. Uh, it, it was all driven home, um, perhaps more, most viscerally. I saw Bob Brink here earlier, and there may be a few other legislators that are here. Um, you know, I loved being governor, and, and people remember when I was governor, those of you who had a chance to visit with me, uh, there I got to be in the governor's office on the third floor of Mr. Jefferson's Capitol. And at least for the first nine weeks of being a newly minted senator, I was down in a four-room windowless suite in the basement of Dirksen Senate office building. And a couple guys from Richmond came down, saw me in those new quarters and said, gosh, Warner, who'd you piss off already? <laughs> so um, it is a transition. Uh, but I've, I've moved up. I'm now up to the, uh, over in the Russell Senate office building and would like to extend a, uh, uh, a welcome to any of you who, when you get to Washington, please come and see me. And this effort this morning is hopefully will be the first of a series that we will try to put on. One of the most exciting things um, about the stimulus package, it, to my mind, is that there are a series of public policy areas that for years both political parties have been talking about as goals, but they've been normally talked about and no resources have been put behind them. Obviously, healthcare IT being one of those, comparative effectiveness research being another, you know, broadband, high-speed rail, energy conservation, um, competitive grants in terms of education. There's a series of areas that are going to come out of these stimulus dollars that are brand new with some real oomph behind them. And what we hope to do over the next, um, uh, the next six months or so is, is by sector bring down the top folks from the administration, the top folks, experts in the area, uh, and then have a chance for Virginians who are have an interest in these subject matters to interact and learn firsthand. Actually, Dr. Blumenthal uh, mentioned uh, he was just appointed in, in uh, late March, started his position in, uh, in late April. He is the National Health IT Coordinator, and this is his first visit out of Washington to a state for this type of presentation. And I thank Dr. Blumenthal for, for being here. I also want to thank Dr. Waugh, the Chief Medical Officer of CSC and former Deputy National Health IT Coordinator. Tony Trinkle, the CMS Director for eHealth Services and Standards. And obviously we also have uh, Virginia's very own Marilyn Tavner, the Secretary of Health and Human Resources. So uh, I am grateful for the whole panel. I'll come back to them in a mo moment. Um, but I also want to recognize and acknowledge uh, someone from, from my staff who I stole away from Governor Kane, uh, who uh, in very short order um, put, this, put this conference together, and that's Ariana Khalid. Ariana, thank you for, for your great work. Now, with this kind of crowd, I don't need to make the basic pitch about why healthcare IT is so important. Um, you know, Sheldon mentioned the fact that uh, as somebody with a technology background and the only politician that says leave your cell phone on, um, you know, I think I understand, I think you understand that it's absolutely critical that we bring the power of information technology to the healthcare field. We've all been talking about it again for years, decades. I've been to HEMIS conferences where you've got thousands of exhibitors offering lots and lots of different products, yet we still have not had any kind of national adoption around healthcare and information technology. And when we spend, as you know and I know, 17% of our GDP, $2.4 trillion a year on healthcare without trying to bring the efficiencies that information technology can bring to our healthcare system, then we are really, I think, making a dreadful mistake. 
And what my hope is, is that starting today, and there's going to be a working group that will continue beyond. We want this to be more than just a one-off conference. Um, starting today, we should aspire in Virginia to be literally setting the gold or the platinum standard. We ought to be the beta site for getting it right. And, um, and again, my hope is our panel today will, will help us with the guidelines, because this will be a multi-year process, as we all know, to get it right, to make sure that we not only get our share of the funds, but equally importantly, that we, uh, uh, we lay it out and bring the power of information technology, bring the value not just to our patients, but as we try to also convince providers uh, of uh, those providers who are perhaps reluctant to uh, make the changes that are necessary to, to use these new tools. What I want to do in my couple of moments, though, is, is lay out kind of my prescription around healthcare IT. And as any good uh, elected official, I've tried to think about it, how you can do it in an easy to explain way. My prescription is, would be called the three I's. And those three I's are infrastructure, information, and incentives. Now, infrastructure obviously being the first. Uh, and that means as we think about healthcare IT, we've got to make sure we get the infrastructure right, the foundation right. To my mind, that means we must have national standards. I hope that at the end of the day, we don't have something where we end up prescribing a single software solution, but we desperately need to have the national standards to then allow the private providers to build to those standards. Again, I use the, uh, from my own background, the analogy of cell phones. As the co-founder of Nextel, you know, your Nextel phone and your AT&T phone and your Sprint phone and your Verizon phone, if there had not been the creation of a national standard around the cell phone industry, these would have all been competing, stand, competing technologies and you would have never had the ubiquitousness that comes around from a truly wireless network. We need to have that same kind of interoperability within the healthcare IT system. But I also have to acknowledge that IT, as much as we're going to advocate and speak about it and, and say that it is part of the solution, it is not a solution set in itself. IT is only the means to an end, and that end should be a more efficient and effective provider patient experience. Um, yet, as we've said, we finally now, with the, with, the, with the stimulus package, have the resources to allow us to build this infrastructure. I remember the previous Secretary of Health, uh, somebody uh, uh, who I'd served with as a fellow governor, Mike Levitt, great guy, uh, but I remember, you know, kind of parameter-wise, he would talk about, uh, you know, how excited he was to be able to have a $15 million program around healthcare IT. Well, now, what we've got out of the stimulus is over, it's over five to seven years, we now will have, from the federal government, over $30 billion to try to put the incentives, to build that infrastructure, to try to make sure that uh, uh, we get this national system right. Now, if the feds are going to step up with these kind of resources, what I think it then means to get this infrastructure built, what it means for you as providers, as individual docs, as healthcare systems, as universities, we can't keep kicking the health IT bucket down the road. The time for action, the time for setting those standards is now. And now, while I am very proud of, and Sheldon mentioned some of the things that VCU's done, and I commend what VCU's done. I know we've got some folks here from Carilion, some of the things they've done as well. Um, but we've got to acknowledge that while there are one-off examples of getting it right around creating that EMR or try fully bringing the power of, health or of IT to the healthcare system, we've still got a long way to go. And I candidly, and if the feds are going to put up this kind of money, have lost patience with those providers who say, well, we don't want to have a truly interoperable system. Or those providers who say, we really are a little reluctant about sharing this data with our competitors. Or those docs who say, hey, you know, I don't, want, don't tell me how I should be practicing medicine. Well, this is the last field in our economy that hasn't been transformed by information technology. Telecom has, manufacturing has, agriculture has. It's time for healthcare to, 
to do the same. So my hope is as we build this infrastructure um, that we recognize we're going to have to be, I think, much more active with both carrots and, if necessary, sticks on trying to make sure that we all move to this national standardized system. So the goal first is infrastructure. Second goal is information. Um, if we've got a wonderful infrastructure, but we don't have quality information, then we're really not going to be able to determine the kind of, uh, uh, get the kind of value out of this investment. And one of the things that I think is a great corollary to the investment in HIT that comes out of the stimulus plan is also the over billion, do billion dollars that's put out in comparative effectiveness research. You know, for too long, we have not been able, those of you who are providers may know, but those of us who are policymakers sure as heck don't, don't really know what works and what doesn't work. Why does the same procedure at Mayo's cost half as much as a procedure at UCLA when the outcomes at Mayo's are twice as good? How, we finally got with this billion dollars plus of comparative effectiveness research, the dollars to start putting behind an analysis of what really works and what doesn't work within the healthcare field. And that information combined with the infrastructure that we hopefully will build out in this, in, with information technology, will really empower us. Um, I, for example, believe uh, we need, you know, while there are clear concerns about uh, privacy, and I know that some of the reporters were asking about some of the challenges we've even had here in Virginia on making sure we, we keep this information secure, I don't see why uh, and let me throw this out as a question to stimulate conversation, why the federal government couldn't make available the existing data that we've got from Medicare Part A, Part B, and Part D, put that information out and allow private providers to data mine that. And you've got to, again, put privacy protections in place. But think about the wealth of information we've already got within the system that whether you're a healthcare system or a, a healthcare IT professional, we really don't have good access. So the second part of my 3i prescription is information. The third piece is incentives. I truly believe that one of the great challenges of the overall healthcare <coughs> debate, and you know, it is constantly the buzzwords coming out of Washington, is we've got to move our system from a healthcare system that's based on volume of healthcare outputs into a system that looks at quality and cost. And the only way we're going to get to that system where we actually can drive down our costs and increase the quality is if we try to realign our financial incentives so that we don't simply pay for the number of tests you do or the number of procedures that you do, but we really get the incentives right on the front end in terms of wellness and prevention, that we really get the incentives right in terms of pushing towards quality. To my mind, again, that leap loops us back around to the infrastructure issue so that uh, uh, I, I believe we have to be much more aggressive in terms of using financial incentives to get docs and systems to use this ubiquitous healthcare IT. I, for, for one, believe if you're, a, if you're a doc that says, well, I don't want to be told how to practice medicine, fine, you don't want to use an EMR, you don't want to e-prescribe, you don't want to use some kind of truly utilize healthcare IT, maybe we ought to only reimburse you 95 cents on the dollar. And if you do use these systems, maybe we'll give you a buck three. But we are going to have to be much more aggressive about getting our financial incentives right, not only around healthcare IT, but obviously around the overall efforts of healthcare reform. Um, it's going to be an exciting time. You know, from a more macro standpoint, beyond healthcare uh, IT, um, I think you will see the Senate mark up a major health care, comprehensive health care reform bill, um, at least at the committee level, uh, by midsummer. Um, if this is an area, as a, as a new senator, I'm trying to uh, you know, get a piece of in terms of the debate. I've been working actually with uh, Dr. Retchen and, and others on trying to take on uh, a very challenging part of this debate, actually to start the conversation that has also, I think, been missing from overall comprehensive health care reform, which is about how we as a <coughs> society deal with end-of-life issues, uh, which is not only a health care issue, not only a, a, a financial issue, but obviously a religious and moral issue as well. And, 
in uh, either later this week or next week, I, I hope to be introducing a fairly comprehensive piece of legislation around uh, not just immediate end of life, but in the kind of uh, whole series of issues around palliative and end of life care, and would invite uh, anybody in this room to get to me or Ariana about uh, ideas in that sector. Um, but it is an extraordinarily exciting time to be in Washington. I do believe you know, the conversations about health care reform that we've been having for years, I think we really are going to get it right this time. But if we do get it right, or if we do get it done, I guess getting it right will be the determination after we get it done. But if we do get it done, the way that we will evaluate whether healthcare reform works or not is really going to be dependent upon how well we use information technology. Again, not the means in itself, but clearly the way we can evaluate effectiveness, clearly the way we can bring down costs, and at the end of the day, I believe, improve patient quality and uh, patient satisfaction.